using AI, cloud, ML, data, 5G to predict the future, I think is very powerful. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. Um, a little bit about me. Um, um, I've been in the tech space for over 25 years. And my claim to fame is creating new categories. Uh, I'm on my fourth category. The first one was the laptop. You know, long, long time ago, uh, we were working with desktop PCs and you had to go to the PC to access the internet. We changed that at Intel by moving to laptop PCs and you could work on your laptop any place, in a flight, in a train, so the internet came to you. The second segment we created was the handheld segment, which later evolved to the tablet space. The third is of course the smartphone. We cannot live without one these days. Four billion of us have at least one of them. Um, so I've been going smaller and smaller. Um, laptop, handheld, smartphone. But my true love is the wearable segment. Um, I had the privilege of starting the wearable segment at Qualcomm uh, over five years ago. Um, I continue to lead it, continue to grow it. Uh, over the last five years, we have worked with our customers and partners uh, to launch 250 wearables. So on average, one wearable a week. Some companies are big, like Fossil and Samsung. Uh, other companies are startups. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by um, the previous discussion uh, from Soundbrenner. Um, so I have worked with different um, sizes of companies and helped them launch wearable products in the industry. Um, I also worked in Intel Capital for a couple of years. And as Thomas mentioned, I invest on the side. It's my hobby. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what the startups have in store for us and maybe providing some guidance. Great. Thank you, Pankaj. Thank you. Looking forward for the discussion with you and later the, the, the pitches as well. Thanks. Um, next is Bryony Cooper. Bryony is a startup entrepreneur who turned into a venture capital um, capitalist. <laughs> um, and she co-founded three tech companies. She ran Brink's IoT Accelerator in Bahrain before she joined Arkley Brink as managing partner. And um, yeah, they invest in early stage deep tech startups. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, Brandy. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, Thomas. Um, and yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me back again. It's lovely to be here. Um, so yeah, Thomas gave you a quick overview of my background. Basically, for the last 12 years, I've been, um, you could say, playing the field in the startup ecosystem. And I've had the privilege to basically go through the startup fundraising experience from every side of the table. So first of all, as a serial entrepreneur, um, I was co-founder and CEO of three tech companies. I started off in the software as a service space in the smart mobility and, and logistics sector. Um, and then I transitioned over into the IoT and hardware space, which is what got me on the path I'm on now, um, where I was heading a digital health venture um, whilst running also a venture builder program with IXDS Labs in Berlin. Um, yeah, and then uh, when I met Brink, the idea was to actually launch this new venture capital fund together with a hardware investor from Poland uh, called Arkley. 
Um, but in the meantime, they kept me busy running an accelerator over in Bahrain for the whole Middle East and North Africa region um, for IoT and connected hardware. So, you know, I got to go from being a, a founder that was fundraising and always the one asking investors for money to then being in a more coaching and mentorship position to actually help other founders on their fundraising journey. And now finally uh, running a VC fund we're the ones giving the, fun, the money. So it's quite interesting to have that kind of 360 perspective. And I try to use that experience as much as I can to support early stage founders and especially women founders as well, who I can really relate to the journey that they're on. So hopefully I can provide some value today. For sure, for sure. Thank you, Bryony. Um, yeah, I'm so happy that we have this international setup here. Um, thanks. Next is um, Andre Heeg. Andre Heeg is Managing um, Director and Partner at BCG Venture, Digital Ventures, a subsidiary of the Boston, Boston Consulting Group, specializing in the development of digital business models for corporations. And what that exactly means, um, Andre, I think that's for you to explain. Thank you for being with us. And yeah, that's, the stage is yours. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so currently I'm responsible in Europe for uh, building our uh, healthcare ventures. Um, so basically what it is, is corporate venture building. Yeah, we work always with large companies in order to come up with ideas and then um, validate and incubate those. Um, by background, why I ended up in healthcare is uh, I'm a medical doctor and also a dentist. Like early in my career, I worked as a maxillofacial surgeon. Um, uh, a lot of interesting stories uh, over a beer yeah, that I can share during the time. Um, and then uh, early on, I, uh, I moved to the US and helped build uh, a, an early healthcare disruptor called SockDoc uh, in the online appointment uh, booking space where I was responsible for the commercial side. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, yeah, stayed in the digital health uh, ecosphere as an advisor, uh, angel investor, uh, and so on. And in between, before joining Digital Ventures, I was also CDO at Sandoz, the generics division of Novartis, helping them uh, stand up the digital unit. So like I mentioned, like parallel to my, to my job at Digital Ventures, where we build startups and also invest in those, um, I, uh, uh, as, a, as a little sidekick, I also invest in uh, like privately in, in startups and uh, we have a great focus on, uh, on healthcare because that is... Uh, that is what I kind of understand and uh, where I feel comfortable. Yeah. So looking forward to everything uh, we hear today. Thanks. Thank you, Andre. Um, another private investor on stage. Super interesting. Thank you. Um, then next we have Mina Begum. Um, she's head of scouting at LEED, who LEED is a um, legacy of Adolf Dassler that is like coming from the origins of Adidas uh, and very, very interesting. Um, and LEED sports and health um, tech partners, sources, funds and drives growth of early stage sports and health tech startups globally. And LEED works with groundbreaking solutions across the verticals of fan engagement, connected athletes and health and well-being. And I think that sounds like the future to me. So thank you for being with us, um, Mina, and happy to listen to what you have to share. Sure. Well, I think you did such a great introduction. Um, but, for, uh, but thank you so much for uh, having me, um, for being part of this panel. Um, my name is Mina. As uh, Thomas said, I'm the head scout at LEED. Um, so I've been in the innovation space for most of my professional career. Um, I started off working uh, at an innovation consultancy in London, where I got the opportunity to work with some of the most renowned brands like Google, NatWest, um, British Airways, and connected them with startups who are building solutions to their business challenges. So it was great to kind of really um, be part of the of that dynamic, but also, you know, understand um, or look at companies through the lens of commercial um, kind of uh, stance. So right now I'm part of LEED, uh, where I manage the full um, scouting and selection process for academies. And part of that includes sourcing um, and doing all the due diligence and analyzing the fit for our investment thesis, but also for our seed fund. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it there and uh, yeah, cover the rest uh, during the panel. Great, yeah. 
Thank you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, then let's start. And um, I mean, as we have now learned, you all come from kind of different backgrounds. We have um, Pankaj, like he's really from variable um, tech, Qualcomm, which is almost everywhere you can find Qualcomm technology and as a private investor. Then we have Bryony, she comes from deep tech. Um, Andre is the background is digital health, and now we also have sports and health tech through Mina and Lead. Um, but still, you're all here to um, kind of jury our wearable tech innovation award. Um, so the question would be, um, what it makes it from your perspective, from your individual perspective, what makes wearable tech interesting? And maybe also, what makes wearable tech investments different from other investments that you would consider. So uh, I don't know who wants to start here, but um, I mean, Pankaj, obviously you have such a broad background. Maybe you could start and uh, tell us a little bit about what, I mean, you're, you're running variables, but what makes it different from the other things you have been working on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Thomas. Um... When we talk wearable, wearable tech, the size of the market is at least 7 billion people. I wear three or four wearables. So the TAM is much bigger. Um, but it's very difficult to build a good wearable. Um, I like to say, you carry technology, but you wear fashion. If you're going to put something on you, it needs to be personalized. It needs to be unique. It's, it needs to deliver a good user experience. Just having the latest tech is not enough. The design has to be appealing. The execution has to be right the ability to personalize has to be there. Um, literally, you have to appeal to the heart, soul, mind of the consumer. And each one of us is different. So we, we all don't want the same thing. Um, so from a startup with such a big term, such a diverse set of requirements. How do you build a product that appeals to enough individuals and you can scale? It's the nature of um, that equation that, that makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, that Okay, we have, we have a broad, uh, we have basically every human is a potential customer here, but um, Bryony, because you worked with user experience and at IXDS, for example, and what, like, what would you say, uh, react to this? Because is segmentation maybe a strategy? Is there different target groups? And what, because <clears throat> Florian just mentioned that you need this huge team, but maybe if you, sharpen your efforts towards one target group, one solution, do you think that is something that would help a startup? Or what is your experience here? Yeah, I mean, IXDS gave me some really interesting insights into how important usability is and user-centered design, because it's very difficult to make people change their habits. You know, if they're not used to wearing a watch and then you're asking them to suddenly put something on their wrist, you know, it's, it's a big ask to get someone to change their daily habits. So it has to be something that blends very seamlessly into their everyday life and something that's just easy enough to use that it won't feel like any kind of inconvenience. And I think the other thing that's really important when it comes to wearables, especially if you're looking kind of at consumer products or B2C products, is that they need to solve a real world problem and not just be a gimmick, you know? Um, if you actually wanna have longevity, uh, you know, and have a long customer lifetime value, you want them to use your product again and again and not just try it once or twice and then put it in a cupboard to gather dust. 
Um, so I think it's also thinking about, you know, can there be some kind of platform or ecosystem behind the hardware device um, that's engaging the customer on a longer term basis? And is it giving them data that has real value? And then my final point, I would say about the data collection, which of course, this whole big data layer, which is behind any kind of IoT or wearable tech. For us as a fund, it's really important that the data security is there. Because, you know, first there was a conversation with smart home devices where you have an object in your home that can potentially watch you or listen to you. Um, now, you know, we're talking about putting something on our bodies. You know, this is our most personal and our most intimate data that we're sharing. So for us, we want to make sure that the, the encryption and the security level is there and that we can choose as users who we share our data with and what data we're actually sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Interesting. By the way, tomorrow we have a panel on blockchain <clears throat> that, that is discussing this topic, um, who, uh, like just for the, uh, as a little hint for the audience. Very good. Thanks, uh, André, because you're, you're from the digital health um, side of the topic. Um, I guess data security is also big for you. Um, what makes a good startup f for you as an investor? Yeah. Um... So many things, obviously, right? Yeah, you start with the very broad strokes and like the typical frameworks of uh, what is the product, what are the people involved and uh, what is the market, right? And usually the market always wins. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, like when I, when I look at uh, especially like digital health and wearable uh, startups, um, there are a few considerations I have. The first one, whenever hardware is involved, I ask myself, like, how difficult is it to build that, right? And can you build that consistently, right? Is it very easy tech and it's almost like a commodity and everyone can kind of like source it, right? Or is it super difficult to build and you can run into capacity constraints and so on uh, when one factory is shutting down? So that is that is one. The second one is, and uh, Bryony uh, already mentioned it, like, the big question, like what is in it for me, right? Like whatever variable you put on you is kind of intrusive. And we all know from like Google classes, it probably was a little bit ahead of its time, right? The face was kind of like the no-go area, right? Like people were nervous about putting something in their faces, right? So maybe today is different, but um, we still have to prove that. So the big question is, is the upside that I'm getting from using something big enough that I will put it on my body? Yeah, that's the second one. The third one, and that is probably a little like a uh, little thing for me. I'm like very obsessed with this uh, uh, computer or machine human interaction. Yeah. So uh, I'm a total believer that in the future, maybe distant, maybe, maybe not so distant, right? It's like ready player one, right? Like we will hook up to a machine, like we will immerse ourselves in a virtual reality, right? And I'm very interested in like, what are the solutions that get us there, that get us closer to that reality? Um, so how does technology interact with our human body, right? Like how do sensors uh, get us closer to that, right? So that is something that I look at um, for the more long-term vision. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. <clears throat> Virtual reality, it, it reminds me of eSports as well. So, um, Having doing sports in a virtual environment, um, Mina, is that a topic for you at the sports um, accelerator, sports tech? Yeah, so I think um, I mean during COVID last year, esports has always been a huge thing. Um, during last year, when live events weren't happening anymore, a lot of the organizations switched to esports, like you had Formula One. Um, interestingly enough, one of our startups, um, they were they were part of our second cohort, they were called Ruta. So they essentially um, they were a fan engagement app that allowed um, users to voice their opinion. So it was something that connected from uh, all fans from all around the world around a specific event. And obviously, when COVID hit, um, they weren't able to, um, you know, things came to a halt. Uh, so they really had to rethink their entire proposition um, and they noticed that uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the gaming content in the world was streaming um, and you know the remaining let's say 10 or 15 percent was recorded content and they had a great tech team already um, to build something fresh and now 
I mean, the, the users have skyrocketed. India, where they are right now, is a huge market for them. Um, and since kind of switching to uh, esports and um, online um, gaming, um, you know, uh, streaming, they have I think around 30 million, sorry, 300 million users. And you know, it's a market that's that has like one over one billion people. Um, so esports definitely has a lot of. It's, it's very very lucrative. Um, I think the only the only other uh, thing for for esports startup is to consider you know how do you how do you monetize this group? That's one thing that we have noticed. Uh, it is very hard because people <coughs> spend a lot of money on buying consoles and buying video games, but what else what what else can you get from them? So that's 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 the only challenge that we have, we see all the time. Uh, monetize, monetizing a user acquisition is always um, a little difficult. Mm -hmm. th th Thomas, if I can go back, um, you, you touched on segmentation. And, you know, earlier in the week, um, I talked about convergence. Um, another thing that makes wearable tech really challenging is the industries coming together work at very different pace. So, um, uh, Andre, if I think about wearables in healthcare, you know, tech moves so fast. Healthcare does not move fast. Um, if I talk about fashion, actually what, what we find is there are five seasons in the fashion space. And so fashion moves faster than tech. If I look at luxury, you know, like a Louis Vuitton, you buy a handbag forever, but tech moves really fast and so on and so forth. So um, wearable tech is bringing together different industries. They don't move at the same pace. And so managing that, you know, don't change tech too often or adapt the health space, the fashion space, um, to the tech space, that brings another level of challenge in bringing a good product, not just once, but, you know, consistent roadmap over time. If I can jump in there, I think, Pankash, you have a very good point, actually, about this <laughs> discrepancy in the speed of the industries, because actually med tech and health tech is a sector that we've been wanting to invest in with our Arkley Brink Fund for quite some time. And we've evaluated a lot of startups in that space. And some of the biggest risks that seemed, you know, almost insurmountable at times were the, the time and the money that it actually takes to get the necessary certification because of the legislation surrounding this industry you know, is, is a big, it's a big ask. And so it's actually trying to find the sweet spot where the startups kind of close enough to commercialization for it, you know, for them to have really valid data, um, you know, about the, the demand and the feasibility of this project. So that's kind of been what's hindering us getting into that market space so far. Um, now we could venture in a like multi-hour discussion. On, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'll say on it for now. I'll leave it to you, Andre. No, no, no. <laughs> You're better. absolutely right. Yeah, I mean that is that is the challenge of the area, right? Like you you have regulatory requirements, right? You have to go through uh, approval and certification processes and so on, right? Um, it's uh, I mean it's it's healthcare, right? Like a lot of like checks and balances are in place in order to make sure that products are safe to use, right? That you don't display something that is ultimately life-threatening or leads people on a path that they do something uh, not wise for their health, right? So yeah. clearly, yeah. But ultimately, it's also the, the fundamental uh, need of people that you serve with basically uh, uh, with these devices, right? Like when you are sick and uh, you want to solve the like remote access to healthcare and so on and, and monitoring people and so on. So it's it's incredibly important and the market is massive, right? But yeah. uh, and and once you're in there, also uh, the final point is uh, the barriers to entry. Like we said, it's, this works in both sides, right? It's it's tough to get in, but once you're in, it's also easier to defend than uh, than a consumer product. Yeah, and it's 
it's certainly where I, it's one of these segments where I see the most value. So we're definitely not giving up on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, please don't. Yeah. Actually, um, for this, for this year's program, we've invested in a, in a company called Oxyware. So they, um, it's a super cool product. So it's an air uh, clip-on wearable. Um, so when you have um, the pulse oximeter that give you SpO2 levels, um, these guys have done it on the earlobe because that's the second uh, most kind of accurate uh, place to do it. And for those guys, you know, they want to market themselves as, um, you know, uh, diagnostic that can help you um alert you more of to kind of give you hy uh, hypoxia alert so when that's about to happen and that could be absolutely detrimental but for now before waiting for the fda approval you know they have to place they have to market it as such that you know we're not a healthcare device but more um we'll alert you when something um dire is going to happen to your health right. so there are a lot of barriers when it comes to that but again if you're looking at it from a consume mass consumer level Again, um, how how much how how many people really need real um, sorry accurate levels of your oxygen? But I think um, you know it's definitely an interesting one, but a lot of hurdles as well to go, to come across. I have a question to all of you. It's based on what Pankaj said. Would it help, for example, if a startup already could present a collaboration, let's say in the fashion sector with a big brand? Would that um, would that for you as investors, I guess that would be a benefit for them. Like it would be a pro argument. Like, would, so and my question where I want to go with this is what would you as investors prefer? The, um, the disruptive way? Okay, let's completely reinvent the shoe or whatever and found a new company that has the digital running shoe or the digital whatever. Or is it more like, okay, we have a collaboration with Adidas, Nike, Reebok, whatever it is, and we are delivering one part of the shoe and we're creating a platform. For you as investors, what would you prefer? <laughs> Maybe it's not so easy to answer, but I think that is very interesting for startups as well to understand. Yeah, sure. I think it depends on your appetite for risk, right? And how you manage your portfolio, right? If you if you go for the high risk stuff only, then uh, yeah, I mean you take a lot of risk, right? If you uh, if you balance it out with some more safer bets, like especially now looking again at healthcare, right? Like when startups partner with large companies like pharmaceutical companies, for example. What they are looking for is expertise in regulatory expertise in go-to-market, yeah, like access to doctors and so on. That these are these are real tangible assets that large pharmaceutical companies have that startups usually don't have, right? So obviously that's that's a huge pro if you can show that. Yeah. Um, the other stuff is is sometimes more exciting, right? When you really want to disrupt how stuff is done, right? But uh, naturally, this has more risk attached. Do the others also agree to this? Yeah, um, I would agree with Andre. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I think someone else was going to say something. Did I interrupt? No, no, go ahead, please. Um, sorry, totally forgot my point. Jump to the no next one. <laughs> Yeah. So, so okay. So, um, we, we, I think the key is and uh, to find partners, right? And uh, being very disruptive. I mean, for example, we listen to Soundbrenner. I think they reinvented something. You know, uh, before, uh, like uh, they re reinvented the metronome. You can now wear it on your wrist. It's a standalone product, and they go now into different segments. They also have an app, and they have different devices. But they have, could have also gone the other way and partnered with a big music manufacturer, and then. They, they could have also gotten into, they could have had a uh, customer base and everything, but they went, they're doing it their own way. And I, I, I think in this case, it makes sense. So, but, yeah. yeah, Pankaj. Yeah, yeah, Thomas, I'll jump in. It, it's, um, um, in a sense, it's, it's the portfolio mix. Um, you know, I look for three types of companies in this space, wearable, IoT, AI spaces. Are you solving a core problem? Um, you know, if somebody can come up with a way to change battery chemistry, so instead of one or two days or one or two weeks, I get a year. I'm investing in that. Um, um, is somebody inventing a new sensor? 
is somebody making it possible so I can wash my shirt hundreds and thousands of times and the sensors don't lose value. So one is core technology. Um, second is um, the scale story. Like I mentioned earlier, um, I want a personalized wearable, but can the startup do that in such a way that they have a good revenue scale story? Um, you know, across a demographic, across regions, and so on. And last but not the least, yes, it does take an ecosystem. Um, uh, just doing, you know, a small widget is not enough. Just doing uh, the product is not enough. Um, a wearable is not very useful if it is not quote, end to end, if it does not have the right content, if it does not have the right service. Um, so I don't know if you can pick one over the other. Um, a startup can be in one of these three, you know, focus in one of these three areas. And um, uh, from an investment standpoint, um, over a period of time, I would want a portfolio of companies doing something in A, something in B, something in C. Um, but the importance of C is paramount to your question. Interesting. Um, so, uh, yeah, Bryony. Yeah, I remember what I was going to say when I had a brain freeze. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to partnering with bigger brands, it depends what type of value they're bringing as well, because it depends, are they going to be one of your first customers and you'll actually be getting revenues from them? And that would be a huge endorsement to you as a, as a startup. Um, there have been other cases, and I won't name names, but some corporate um, VCs, where they promise access to high level executives that you would never really get access to that kind of talent. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't really materialize in the reality. So they might have big promises um, because they want to plug into that startup innovation, um, you know, sector. But actually the reality is these important people are, are too busy and don't really have time to invest there. Um, so, you know, just being affiliated with them in the end doesn't deliver much value. So the question is, is that brand actually gonna act like a distributor and let you plug into their network of customers, which is amazing, or do you just get to be associated with them but nothing really materializes from it beyond that? And that might even put off some of their competitors as potential customers for you because you're kind of belonging to them if you've been through their accelerator program, for example. I think, yeah, maybe Mina, you know a lot more about corporate VCs than me. So maybe you have some experience in that. I'm going to touch on that. It's interesting you say that. So when I used to work at the at my previous uh, previous company, um, you know, you used, we had to get the buy-ins from um, C-level uh, people. And, you know, doing doing the daily, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day plus working with startups is always a bit of a was always a bit of a struggle. Um but then you know you need to have, they need to have people on the ground. So to make the program a success, they need to make people they need to have people on the ground. You also do have some level of decision making power. Um, but you know what I with with lead right now, um, part of our due diligence, you know, it's super rigorous. I mean, we look at we you know assess the companies on all across the business. So leadership is number one. Um, looking at the business model, looking at the the scalability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, part of that is also commercialization. So understanding, um, you know, who they've worked with. And for some, it might be, you know, when you work, when a big brand is working with a startup, the startup they, um, the, for the big brand is, oh, you know, you can then, um, we'll, we'll give you endorsement, we'll promote you to our social media, but there's no, there's no commercial um, aspect there. They're not getting paid for it. And, you know, for some companies, that's great because it gives them a great boost. But, you know, we do want to see that there is, you know, they have a, a customer whether those are users or big big clients, especially if it's looking at the, the B2B. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think um, there are a lot of things to look at when obviously um, seeing if the, uh, if the uh, startup is investable and part of that is, you know, partnership if it makes sense. You, you know, the, the other thing I would add is um, in the wearable space, um, we, we can name names. Um, Apple is very successful. 
Google is investing a lot, you know, buying company, buying Fitbit and, and so on. Samsung is very successful. Garmin is very successful. Big, big companies are very successful. Um, so if you're a startup in the wearable space, how do you stand out? What is your exit strategy? Is it to be bought by one of these big companies? Um, if it is to stay independent, you really need to have a well-defined differentiator to compete with the big guys. Um, and you know, I would add that to the list of why it is so challenging um, for a startup in the wearable space. H having said that, having said that, um, there is plenty of uh, opportunity for innovation. The use cases remain in flux, the, the technologies need to continue to be improved. The, the convergence, figuring out how to bring different industries together is not a walk in the park. Um, making good deals, small companies, big companies, um, companies with you know, service providers, um, truly a global marketplace working across regions, cultures, languages. Um, th there are plenty of challenges um, and only the brave survive. I think that is a very good point. What are the challenges for startups and what do they under all costs need to keep? Like for you as investors, let's say you're invested in a startup as a um, angel investor or some kind of mentor as well, okay? So would you, what would you tell them? What kind of IP do they need to keep under all circumstances, even if they bring in other investors or if they go into a collaboration with a big brand or something? And uh, what is the valuable part that they need to keep from your perspective? Um, I don't know who wants to answer to this question, but I think that is also very relevant for our startups that are listening. Um, I, I would have to, one piece. Yeah. Sorry, with that, Andre. Briny. Oh, please um, go ahead, please. I, I was gonna refer to the talk that was just before our panel. You had Florian from Soundrunner and he talked about one of the biggest mistakes that they did, which I see a lot of startups doing is assuming too much without really testing those hypotheses and validating those assumptions. You know, just because you think your product is super cool and a few of your friends think it's super cool, there's a big difference between whether a large enough portion of the market is actually willing to spend money and buy that product. So, you know, even doing customer surveys about do people find this interesting or a good idea, at the end of the day, are they willing to pay for it? So I think validating those kind of assumptions and hypotheses is, is one of the most important things they can do. And when it comes to hardware and wearables, especially before they start building, I mean, I've said in a lot of my workshops, there is no such thing as build it and they will come. This is the death of hardware startups. <laughs> so that, that would be my main advice. Oh, I, I want to uh, piggyback on that. Uh, I full heartedly agree. Yeah? So um, the validation process uh, and like a real deep one is super crucial, right? Like I, uh, I learned this early on when I still was a doctor, right? When you would talk to a diabetic or overweight person, like what they eat and like what their nutrition is, they will all list like the stuff that is healthy and that, 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 they, that they would eat and drink. But when you go home to them and open the fridge, you see like the, the reality, right? Like you see what is actually there. And uh, you, you realize there's a mismatch of what they're telling you and what actually is, right? And that's the same thing, right? When you when you have a, 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 a device, right? You show people and say, hey, that's cool, right? But does it solve a real problem in people's daily life? And would they actually use it? Would it integrate with what they are doing, right? Does it blend in or is it something obscure that they get asked questions by others and they feel exposed or so, right? Like, um, uh, is it a status symbol that they want to show, right? Like really understand that. Yeah, I think that is a, that is a super, a super important point. Mm -hmm. 
Mina, um, uh, Pankas just said, it's not only the device, it's also uh, the ecosystem or the other services that come with it. Um, you as a scout for startups, for lead, um, how, like, how much is that a factor for you? Mm -hmm. um, def so yeah, you're right. It, 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 it just can't be, it can't be a rare one. There are a lot of things to, to consider as well. Um, so for example, you know, what you guys had said as, as well about, um, you know, validating the market. I think the other, uh, you know, just to kind of add to that before I answer that, that was, you know, understanding, understanding the pricing strategy for the users. Is this something that users are, your customers are going to, are going to use? Um, when it comes to the wearable, for sure, it can't just be, you know, giving you data around what, how many steps have you taken? What, what are your, what, what is your calorie? Uh, intake, it needs to be completely unobtrusive, but also needs to be able to give you that insight and that recommendation to really help guide you. Um, so just to give you an example, we have, uh, making it more relevant to what we have invested in, um, a company called Point, um, really cool. They're not, it's a software startup, but they um, they integrate with Apple and soon integrating with other uh, wearables. Um, for them, they are looking at helping Uh, customers get guiding them um, as much as they can so really giving that personalization to the user but based on what they are doing so if they have a wearable device or apple let's say and it showed them that they had a very strenuous um, workout they'll give you a recommendation and say hey why don't you do something that's less strenuous to your body or you just did, um, you know in the morning you're better off doing yoga and here is a yoga studio right in your geographic location so they're really piecing different puzzles for let's say newbies like myself and connecting not only one user but also to other users and to other um, fitness facilities and gyms and uh, you know to other companies like let's say Hyperice as well um, so tying in that data piece for uh, wearables is just as important. And Th Thomas I would add I agree with everything um, said here I would add the importance of the team. Um, you know, from a number of angles. If the core team is young, you should have seasoned advisors and mentors and investors. So, so you're not making the same mistakes. If the core team is seasoned, wearables are hot with Gen Y and Gen X and millennial. And you cannot be building a product that your children or grandchildren will be using, right? Um, so so you, um, 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 if the, the right diversity from a gender perspective, from a regional perspective, important. Um, uh, from an investor perspective, it's not just money. It's time, it's expertise, it's network. So somebody who brings all four things is much more valuable than somebody who only writes a check. I know this applies to investment in every space, um, but maybe it applies more so in the wearable space. Um, having the right set of mentors and advisors because we talked about the importance of signing a big customer or collaborating with a big ecosystem player. Um, the mentors and advisors and coaches can open doors that you may not be able to open by yourself. And last point, because we talked about merging of industries, um, making sure you have uh, connections to healthcare, to fitness, to fashion, to luxury, to seniors, to tech. So the diversity of the team, the strength of the team, the breadth of the team, I think super important. Okay, cool, yeah. I, 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 that, I, I, I like it because um, Today we are going to meet the teams um, at the, the pitches and I'm looking forward for this. 
And um, we're a little bit um, running out of time, but I want to use um, the last question for you guys. Um, it's, it's almost tradition here. Um, what is your outlook for the future? Um, when you were to fund a startup yourself, let's say you get 500,000 or more money, uh, dollars, um, independent from what your background is now or where you're investing now, what would it be? Like, would it be artificial intelligence something or would it be some sustainable thing or, auto, or artificial intelligence, mobility or something like that? Um, yeah, what, where do you think will be the appearance of the next iPhone revolution, you know? Uh, what is your opinion here? Who wants to start? I think there's, uh, there's a few different questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I yeah, mean, no, one of them is what I invest my personal money in, and one is what do I think the next big thing will be. It's not necessarily mm. the same. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, what, what's the next big thing for you? Um, well, I think the industry that Andre is in, honestly, as I said, despite the challenges that these startups face, um, health tech and med tech is probably the most important in terms of real life problems um, that technology can solve. Um, and I think that the pandemic has only highlighted and, and accelerated this industry. And you, you will notice when you look at the statistics, how much more VC money has gone into this sector um, over the, one, the last one, one and a half years. Um, yeah, so I think this will, this will be the one to watch. Great. Andre, um, is it the same for you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do it, right? I invest my personal money uh, in, in digital health yeah, because, um, uh, yeah, because I'm convinced that like, uh, this, uh, this is the next uh, big industry that is ripe for disruption, right? It's, it's far behind. If you look, like many other, uh, look at many other aspects of our lives, they have been fully digitized in healthcare we still accept that many things are done like they are done 20 years ago. And I think that is about to change. Um, and uh, the second thing, what I already mentioned is maybe like some decades out, but the machine human interaction, right, is closely linked to health care and how we experience our, our body and, and, uh, and, and our existence. So I think that is something that uh, in, the, in the long term will be very interesting, right? But in the short term, everything digital health for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with the others. I think if COVID has taught us anything last year and this year, it's that health is not to be taken for granted. Um, and I think I would definitely invest, invest in the longevity space and startups who are building solutions for people to take you know, better care of their own health um, and you know, help them, what, help them um, around what they can do to live healthier, but also extend their lifespan. and. Uh, you know, as Byron said, there's so much, so much investment that has gone in through, uh, gone into health tech companies, and I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So may maybe I'll come at it more from a technology standpoint. Um, um, I, you know, 20 years ago, companies would put dot com, and the valuation will go up. Um, the same thing is happening right now. <clears throat> if you put dot AI or dot cloud or dot data, data analytics. Um, the combination of these things basically gives you predictive, the ability to predict the future, um, proactive recommendations. Um, Andre, you, you talked about life coach, health coach in, in our discussion. <clears throat> so using AI, cloud, ML, data, 5G, to predict the future, I think is very powerful. I can apply it to health and medical space that Mina, Byroni, and Andre talked about. Um, uh, not, not, not in wearable, but I can apply it to autonomous driving. Um, I can drive it in different industries in the wearable space. Um, and I think that's where um, a huge amount of money will be made. Um, so to me, that's the future. 
across industries. 